The land of ancient Mesopotamia lay across the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in what is today Iraq and Syria, the traditional location of the biblical Garden of Eden. It was and is a flat, desolate land made green by rivers, canals, and marshes. Yet from this unpromising landscape arose the foundation of Western civilization, including the world's first cities and the earliest known writing system. This story is about Ur, the traditional home of the biblical patriarch Abraham, in one of the most ancient of the southern Mesopotamian city-states. 3,300 years before the construction of the pyramids of ancient Egypt, Ur was already occupied. The modern name of the ancient site of Ur is Tel al mukayyar which in Arabic means mound of pitch. The name comes from the monumental temple tower, which was made of baked mud bricks set into bitumen, or pitch, a naturally occurring form of tar. In 1922, under the leadership of the little-known young archaeologist Charles Leonard Woolley, Excavations jointly sponsored by the University of Pennsylvania Museum and the British Museum were initiated at the site of ancient Ur. The decision to excavate proved to be a fateful one. Perhaps no excavation in the more than 150 years of archaeological work in Mesopotamia has excited as much public interest as Woolley's work at ancient Ur. Woolley's excavations competed only with Howard Carter's discovery of the intact tomb of the boy pharaoh Tutankhamun for public attention. As a result of the extensive publicity, tourists from all parts of the globe, including European royalty and the author Agatha Christie, flocked to the remote site in the Iraqi desert. The artifacts which Woolley uncovered in his excavations at Ur were divided among the Iraq Museum in Baghdad, the University of Pennsylvania Museum, and the British Museum. The art you will see in this exhibition is from the University of Pennsylvania Museum. One of the most important parts of the ancient city was the temple complex of the moon god Nana, at the center of which was a ziggurat. This monument is not a pyramid like those found in Egypt. It is a series of stepped terraces with a temple on top. Woolley's recovery of Ur's ancient ziggurat and the complex of buildings around it was a remarkable find, but it paled in comparison with his discovery of the tombs of Ur's early kings and queens in 1927. Between 1927 and 1934, he uncovered 1,850 of the tombs. Sixteen tombs stood apart from the others. Each contained an extraordinary wealth of artifacts and evidence of human sacrifices. Woolley called them royal tombs because he assumed they contained Ur's deceased kings. Woolley recognized considerable variations in the royal tombs. Tombs PG-789 and PG-800 typified Ur's early dynastic royal tombs. Most of the important artifacts you see in the exhibition come from those two royal burials. PG-800 contained the body of a woman just under five feet tall and roughly 40 at the time of her death, whom Woolley identified as Queen Puabi. The body was adorned with an elaborate headdress. Several layers of gold ribbons, gold leaves, and wreaths of gold, lapis lazuli, and carnelian are all topped by a gold comb with flowers on the end. The whole of the upper body was covered with beads of gold, silver, lapis, carnelian, and agate, which Woolley thought to be the remains of a beaded cloak. Among Puabi's other jewelry was an elaborate gold belt with gold rings dangling from strings of lapis, carnelian, and gold beads. On Puabi's fingers were ten gold rings, and around her right knee was a garter. One of three cylinder seals had an inscription that identified the deceased as Puabi, the queen. 
Near the queen's head was what Woolley described as a diadem made of thousands of small lapis lazuli beads that had been decorated with gold amulets. In this video, you see it as Woolley originally reconstructed it. It may not have been a single piece of jewelry, but rather several different pieces. Among the most spectacular of the precious objects from Puabi's tomb chamber were gold and silver vessels. The metalsmiths of Ur already knew many of the metalworking techniques that are still in use today. The decoration around the outside of this bowl was created by a method known as chasing. Tiny chisels and hammers were used to tap and punch the metal inward to create the patterns. On the ramp leading into Puabi's death pit were the bodies of five men, presumably guards, with copper daggers, a razor, and seven pottery cups. In the middle of the pit in front of the ramp was a sled pulled by oxen. Mixed with the animal bones were those of four grooms. In the middle of the northeast end of the pit were the remains of a wooden chest decorated with lapis lazuli and shell inlay. Bodies and an enormous array of goods surrounded the chest. Gold and silver vessels including a gold tumbler and a spouted cup a spouted cup made of lapis lazuli, which was probably imported from what is today northern Afghanistan. Silver heads of lions that originally decorated a piece of furniture. And a silver cosmetic box containing a black mineral pigment, probably the remains of coal, which is used as an eye makeup. The lid is inlaid with lapis lazuli and shell. At the southwest end of PG-800's death pit lay the bodies of 13 women. The women, all of whom wore elaborate headdresses, had apparently been in two rows facing each other. Musical instruments were found with them. PG-789 and PG-800 provided the foundation for Woolley's accounts of what had happened at the death of Orr's kings and queens. Each man brought a little cup of clay or stone or metal, the only equipment required for the rite that was to follow. There must have been some kind of service at the bottom of the shaft. At least it is evident that the musicians played up to the last and that each drank from the cup. Either they brought the potion with them or they found it prepared for them on the spot and they composed themselves for death. This coil of metal is actually a silver hair ribbon that was found not on her head, but still held in the hand of a young girl. Willie thought she might have been late getting ready for the death pit ritual, and so rushed to the cemetery with the ribbon in hand instead of on her head. Written documents and pictures suggest that music and dancing were almost as common in rituals and festivals as were eating and drinking. We may never have known that the royal tombs contained these musical instruments if Sir Leonard Woolley had not used such inventive excavation methods as he did. The basic form of all the lyres was made out of wood which decays over time. Woolley preserved the shape and size of each lyre by filling the spaces left by the decayed wood with wax and plaster. Because of the work he did, and because of the depictions on the instruments themselves, we know what most of these lyres originally looked like. Many of the lyres were decorated with shaped animal heads like this one. The shape was made of wood, and then gold was pounded into a very thin sheet and attached to the wood with bitumen or pitch. On the front of the sound box, beneath the bull's head, is this panel made of inlaid pieces of white shell on a background of black bitumen. 
Each of the four panels depicts animals doing things that humans do, or fantastic animals with human heads. One of the most famous objects from the whole cemetery features a goat. The ram in the thicket statue is spectacular. It is made of gold, silver, copper, lapis lazuli, red limestone, and bitumen. An engraved picture on a cylinder seal from Mesopotamia shows just such a statue being used as a table. Along with musical entertainment, games were placed in the tombs for the enjoyment of the dead. While all of the board tiles here are of animals and plants, geometric patterns and rosettes were also very common. The Ur excavations are a remarkable story. In Woolley's prize find, the early dynastic royal cemetery, is one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever made. In a real sense, the royal cemetery, a previously unknown chapter in Ur's long history, exists today not just because of the effective collaboration between two museums, but also because of Woolley's extraordinary energy and talent.